Hello and welcome to my second seminar, The Future of Diplomacy, A Global Perspective. This seminar will focus on the increasing number of multifaceted and interrelated challenges and geopolitical shifts in an increasingly complicated international environment that is changing at an ever increasing speed. We will evaluate the role and value of diplomacy, both bilateral and multilateral, as well as the fitness of the current UN system and other multilateral organizations to solve global issues such as climate change, migration, terrorism, inequality, sustainable development, and public health that have been further compounded and exacerbated by the rapid development of both connective and disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence, new types of warfare, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. Joined by two outstanding experts and my long-term colleagues uh, uh, and friends, Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, United Nations Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, and Professor Julian Lindley French, who is the leading security advisor, strategist, and author, we hope to provide insight into the challenges of global relations, emphasizing the value of diplomacy and the opportunities it offers in solving them. Thank you all for joining in, and I hope that you will enjoy our discussion today. When I first joined the diplomatic service of my country in the early 90s, like most of my peers, I did not have much experience in foreign policy and diplomacy. Although those were turbulent times of the war in Croatia, nevertheless, I had time to transition into my new role. We were assisted by a small number of people who had served in the former Yugoslav diplomatic service, by our friends from the diplomatic corps in Zagreb, and by diplomatic handbooks, believe it or not. Our numbers were small, but we worked with much patriotism, zeal, and enthusiasm, establishing diplomatic relations and participating in the peace process in Croatia and the peace processes in the region. I will never forget one of the first days on the job when I was awakened very early in the morning by a message to report to work immediately. I learned that the Croatian security forces had, had conducted a limited police operation in one of the occupied areas of Croatia, which was crucial to provide the circumstances to reconnect the two parts of our country that had been cut off from each other by occupation. When I arrived to work late, um, when I arrived to work uh, in the morning, the building was empty. I first had to get information from the security sector and of course try explaining to those guys why I needed it. I had to invite several foreign ambassadors who participated in the peace process to separate meetings with the deputy foreign minister, write the text of the diplomatic note that would be delivered to them detailing the elements of the operation act as a consecutive interpreter for the deputy minister in the meetings and write reports about each meeting based on my memory and words that I jotted down here and there while interpreting. As I was about done late in the evening, I received a call to write a press release about the operation that no one had written as yet. And I was also told to be very careful about what I say. Well, that took me about a couple of hours, and since everyone who had any experience at that, at writing press releases, had already turned in for the night, an equally young and inexperienced colleague of mine and I called our chief of mission to the UN in New York, who was six hours behind us, and who happened to be a journalist to seek his opinion. He thought the press release was fine and we kept faxing it for another couple of hours, hours to both foreign and domestic media. The next morning, our press release was the front page news in all the media with just the right messages that we wanted them to carry. And again, that was the first press release that I wrote in my life. When I think back of that experience, so much has changed. Something like this would not be possible today from getting classified information to informing the public. There would be a team of experts working on each particular aspect of the operation. 
And there is absolutely no way that the public and the media would be waiting for an old fashioned press release until late night. Not only would the public demand information right here and right now, but the media space would, if, uh, would be saturated with loads of different information, narratives, eyewitness accounts, even fake news and disinformation. So much has changed for diplomacy in the 21st century. Circumstances have changed. International politics have become enormously complex, and it has become difficult for traditional diplomats to anticipate and analyze political risk and provide alternatives to prevent, resolve, or mitigate its consequences. To manage the complexity in a constantly changing multipolar world with tectonic geopolitical shifts, the rise of regional actors and multilateralism under attack, Whereas the challenges cannot be tackled by a single nation state, but must be addressed collectively. Roles have changed and diplomacy is branching out into such areas as public diplomacy, economic and trade diplomacy, military or defense diplomacy, business diplomacy, as countries try to protect and advance their national interests. Actors have changed as well as their relationships. Long gone is the time when international relations were the domain of national states. Today, there are multiple actors ranging from the traditional state actors, super state actors, such as international organizations and alliances, to sub-state actors, such as local and regional authorities, non-governmental organizations and interest groups to transnational actors from multinational co corporations whose annual budget could actually be higher than that of the GDP of most countries in the world, and foundations that alter the global humanitarian landscape to terrorist groups, international activists, hackers and criminals, ethnic or religious groups. And then there are individuals at any level, activists, social media users, citizen journalists and influencers, the so-called common citizens, anyone who can, empowered by the modern communications technology, exert their influence and create their narratives, issues, and agendas. The 21st century risk can be posed at any of these levels and in any corner of the world. The speed at which these changes are happening is relentless and so is the speed of reaction required. So what is the future for diplomacy? Today, we will look at both challenges and opportunities. And let us begin with the former. I am delighted to introduce and welcome Professor Julian Lindley French, leading security advisor and strategist, as well as an author of 11 books and numerous renowned articles and reports on topics including European defense, NATO, and geopolitics. Professor Lindley French is currently a senior fellow at the Institute for Statecraft in London, chairman of the high level strategic Do Thank the Alpen Group, director of Europa Analytica in the Netherlands, and fellow of the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. Until 2017, Professor Lindley French served as the Vice President of the Atlantic Treaty Association in Brussels and was made an honorary member of the Association of Anciens of uh, the NATO Defense College in Rome in 2015. He also served on the UK Chief of Defense Staff's Strategic Advisory Group and was head of the Commander's Initiative Group for Lieutenant General Sir Richard Shrift Comark. His new book on future war and the defense of Europe, co-authored with General John Allen and Frederick Ben Hodges, will be available for purchase in May 2021. I had the pleasure of working with him on the Academic Advisory Board of the NATO Defense College in Rome, and we often met in security conferences across the world. I am very grateful to have Professor Lindley French with us for today's seminar and are looking forward to our discussion. He has always been known to be in the avant-garde of security assessment, thinking, and strategizing. Julian, thank you for joining us today. Pleasure, Kalinda. Lovely to be here. Thank you. And good evening from the Netherlands. 
Wonderful to have you at this late hour. Well, Julian, um, a lot has been said about the new transporter and asymmetric uh, threats to security in the post-Cold War era, which have by now practically become traditional. Mm -hmm. Terrorism, climate change, an increasing number of mostly interstate conflicts, failing and failed states, economic and social stress, income inequality, the rise of extremism, nationalism, and populism, etc. However, these have been compounded by other disruptive and highly technical factors, such as the rapid technological development, the 5G network, connective and disruptive technologies, artificial intelligence, demographic shifts, disruptors such as pandemics, and even new types of warfare. You mentioned cyber, hybrid, and hyper warfare, for instance. Mm. What would you say are the most important megatrends in the already complicated and rapidly changing international security landscape? And what are the biggest geopolitical change factors? Thank you, Kalinda. I have to say, listening to your anecdote about your early career, I had similar experiences working for government. Um, anybody, I can tell you, even today, if you're going to go into this business, be able to cope with the unexpected because you can guarantee it will happen. It's just uh, the nature of the business. Look, you know, I'm sitting in Europe and for the first time in 400 years, Europeans in the wider West simply don't make the rule of the road anymore. You know, we simply don't shape the world as we once did. Why? Because connectivity, globalization, this is a, a time of great challenge, but also great opportunity, as you rightly say, Kalinda. And what, what is happening is the interaction of megatrends is is driving uncertainty in policy circles when, when there's so much change so quickly it's very hard for policymakers to keep on top of that change so you see a shift of power going on a shift of wealth a shift of information culture the balance between the state and institutions and indeed the people who are becoming more empowered uh, identities are changing loyalties are changing of uh, of people we have climate change i'm just finishing off a major report for the European Parliament on Arctic security. And one only has to see that the change that's taking place in the Arctic, both, uh, both man-made or human-made, and natural to see the implications of, of, of change. And then you have technologies. I mean, when I was writing the book with John and Ben, we went deep into the new technologies that are entering the battle space. Much of it's civilian driven. In the old days, it was military driven. Uh, but it's quite frightening what adversarial technologies or applications of these technologies, how quickly they will change the character of warfare. And, and, and in a sense, in writing the book, it was a warning. The book is not about war, it's about defense, it's about peace. How do you maintain peace in the midst of such uncertainty? So it's, it's really much this interaction of these megatrends, and megatrends caused by globalization, caused by connectivity, uh, which frankly, most states have not got a handle on. They don't quite grip it because this change is not behaving in the same way that traditional change has taken place. And therefore, at the moment, is not subject to what I would call hyper diplomacy. The need to respond intelligently and in a peaceable civil manner to dangerous change that's happening extremely quickly. We, we simply do not have institutions that are as yet geared for that. And I would suggest to you that that will be the main challenge for the United Nations in the mm -hmm. in, in the years to come. In your new book, you write about the ever present prospect of a major regional strategic war and 5D warfare, meaning disinformation, deception, destabilization, disruption, and implied coercion by implied or actual destruction, to which yeah. you had a 60 disease. Could you please elaborate on these a little bit and how has the COVID-19 pandemic and the related health and economic crisis added to the complexity of the security landscape and accelerated trends that were already evident prior to the crisis? Well, I'm, a, I'm an Oxford, Oxford historian by training. And one looks back at pandemics in history, they accelerate existing change. I look at the Black Death in, in Europe in the, in, in the 1340s and on. Um, it ended the feudal system. It changed the fundamental character of society, uh, accelerated it uh, to the point where 
um, it, society was unrecognizable by the late 14th century to that which had commenced the 14th century. We're seeing the same today. We're, we're seeing a, an accelerant of an already fundamental shift of power and wealth from Europe um, to Asia. And that is causing a, a great deal of uncertainty. Uh, it's also compounded by, and, and forgive me, Kalinda, because you've been president of a, of, of a, a very important European state, but when I speak to so many European leaders, with due respect, they're not just risk averse, they're in denial about risk. Um, they don't understand it. They don't understand the worst can happen. And, and if you want proof that the worst can happen, look at COVID-19. I remember Tony Blair saying once at a meeting that there are so many PhDs written about pandemics um, that uh, they'll never happen. Of course, here we are. We've had this pandemic came out of the blue. So in a sense, certainly in Europe, we're unwilling to face the hard choices that we must. And what the book is about is a warning. A book is about what could happen in Europe. Um, uh, another major war in Europe is no longer unthinkable, uh, given the correlation of forces, given the pressures, given the change, and of course, given miscalculation. Uh, people always, particularly international relations theorists, um, try to drive the human factor out of international relations. To me, it's a dominant factor. It's, it's the more power is concentrated in a few hands, the more dangerous uh, the, or, or the greater danger there is of, uh, of uh, miscalculation. And what I see in Europe right now, and we've had the big British defense review in the last week, which I've advised on, which we didn't do, by the way, but the pressure to focus on health security because that's what in, is, is in everyone's mind at the expense of national security, national defense or European security. I fear that's the big challenge in the coming economic crisis in Europe post, post pandemic, whether we can both have improved health security and the enhanced European security that we'll need to have if our citizens are to be safe in the 21st century. And part of, part of that, by the way, includes understanding that Americans could no longer afford, uh, given what's happening elsewhere in the world, to devote the amount of resource and energy they have to Europe's defense in the past. So in a sense, all the assumptions that you and I have grown up with, in my case, longer. When I started in this business in, on the Cold War, I was looking at Soviet submarines in the Northern Atlantic in the early 1980s. Um, all those assumptions about power, change, threat are changing. And, and frankly, our political class is as yet unable to cope with change. Well, public diplomacy is taking center stage in today's world and countries are expanding their role in exerting and increasing influences across the world. Yeah. And public diplomacy is no longer just about marketing strategies, promotion of values, language and culture, not even um, more sophisticated branding strategies. Today, we see initiatives such as, for instance, One Belt, One Road. So what role do you see for diplomacy? How does uh, strike a balance between hard, soft, and smart power? And in your book, uh, you know, as far as I, I have seen so far, you also, mm. um, you mentioned Europe and the United States, and you talk about a dual approach of uh, not just the face, defense capabilities, but really of aligning the leadership issues. And in that context, also the soft and the smart power, I would yeah. say. Well, yes, I mean, the book came out of a major review of NATO that uh, John Allen and several of NATO's senior personnel, Sandy Virchbau, Gianpaolo Di Paola, uh, and I led back in 2017, the, the, the NATO Adaptation Initiative. And we based our findings on Pierre Harmel's uh, a group of 1967, who strongly recommend that you must have defense and dialogue. Um, Yes, you need sound defense. In, 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 I believe in minimum deterrence, uh, not militarization, but the minimum deterrent relevant to the threat that one could possibly face uh, to maintain the threshold of, of, of military action is maintained at a high level. But dialogue is vital. We must always talk uh, to potential adversaries 
to, to lower the risk of, of conflict. And that's to me why international institutions are vital, like the UN. I've always believed in the UN. I, I worked for a time at the UN. Um, why? Because institutions prevent extreme state behavior. Uh, they, they, they prevent the real politique or macht politique of the 19th century. They grew out of the First World War and Second World Wars when you had that uh, you know, crass, narrow calculation of the national interest. Institutions promote efforts to find common ground, uh, to seek cooperation. And therefore, yes, whilst we must all have an insurance policy of defense, and sadly in today's world that is necessary, uh, the importance of in in institutions cannot, cannot uh, be, be overstated. But in a sense, public diplomacy, I like to make the distinction between public diplomacy and strategic communications. Uh, public diplomacy is a public good. It is about uh, communicating or searching for uh, the common ground. Strategic communications is at the heart of deterrence. Uh, deterrence is all about messaging. It's about sending a message to a potential adversary, look, it really isn't worth you doing what you might think you might want to do. Because if you do, you will not achieve what you think you're going to achieve. And by the way, the price you, you will pay will be very high. So even in dialogue, you've got to have hard dialogue and soft dialogue. Um, but, but essentially the, the old mantra that there ain't no soft power without hard power regrettably remains to this day. And you know, speaking about communications, the rapid development of communications has certainly brought many changes and challenges for governments and diplomatic services. Uh, governments have an obligation to keep their public informed in a truthful and a transparent manner as democracies function on trust. And on the other hand, the demand from the public to be informed is increasing rapidly. People want to participate. It's becoming a participatory process. Um, the new media and social networks have democratized and opened up the information space. However, they have empowered practically everyone to create and disseminate news and political risks. The media space is saturated with trolls, fake news, misinformation, malicious intent, hybrid action aimed at defamation. With the increasing speed of information, the time for response is right now, in contrast to the story that I told earlier. Mm. And as we have it, we have said it so many times in our own deliberations on strategic communications, perception becomes reality. So how do you see the role of diplomacy in information warfare, the battle of ideas, as we call it? And how would you argue the case for strategic communications, how to prevent crisis mm. or even wars with timely and targeted, accurate information? How can we make our societies more resilient to disinformation, violent extremism and cyber attacks, for instance? Well, let me challenge you on one of your statements. The, the responsibility of the state is to defend its citizens. It is not duty bound to tell them everything. Uh, I come from a country, the United Kingdom, where we have advanced intelligent That's capabilities. Good. And we need to keep those things secret because it's in the interest of the citizen. And we tend to find that it's only activists who want to know everything, for good or ill. The majority of the population still, in my country at least, are willing to accept the word of the state that the state is doing its best in their interests. And until that breaks down, I don't see that changing. So when we engage in um, diplomacy, strategic communications, cyber messaging uh, to adversaries, which we do, we're buying time because the reason we think time is important before deciding, whatever the technology, is that either you hand the entire decision-making structure over to a machine, an artificially intelligent machine, which could happen one day in the battle space, but I wouldn't recommend it. Or you need to make the right decision. And that takes consideration. Uh, and uh, strategic communications and public diplomacy are part of a new escalation, if you like, in deterrence from messaging, from information, through conventional force, through the cyberspace, right up to ultimately nuclear weapons, in which you're constantly talking to your adversary, trying to avoid misunderstandings, try to 
to build down to maintain a stability. And that can only be done with, with deliberation. And that's why both diplomacy, public diplomacy, and strategic communications are vital in buying that time before anyone reaches for the arsenal. Because in this day and age, that arsenal, which now includes cyber, digital decapitation, as well as conventional military force or nuclear force, uh, could be extremely destructive. In the book, we open with a scenario uh, which is based on a on actually a, it starts on a sea battle that my my, my grandfather fought in, uh, in 1943 called the Battle of North Cape. We have the Second Battle of North Cape, and it's the start of a major European war, which includes the use of fake fake news, disinformation, destabilization. The essential objective of policymakers, despite all the new technologies, all the new challenges, is to establish a clear relationship between protection of people i.e. robust, resilient societies that can function in an emergency, and that's what matters in an emergency, and power projection militaries, which can defend in a, in a, in a mobile manner. There's no such thing as static defense uh, anymore. What's happened in Europe, in particular, in the last 20 or since the end of the Cold War, is we've, uh, we've built vulnerability into our systems. We've become very, very trusting, which is a nice thing in many ways. But we've laid those vulnerabilities open to adversaries who are now systematically analyzing those vulnerabilities and seeking to exploit them, not just states, but increasingly capable non-state actors. At this point, I'm uh, going to turn to Ethan, one of the co-producers of the seminar and one of my uh, a very valuable student associate to ask you the final question for today. Ethan. Good evening, Ethan. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Kalinda, and thank you, Julian, for being here and for your fascinating Pleasure. discussion to diplomacy, uh, rapid technological development, and strategic communication. Um, so now building off your previous conversation, how can and should we utilize the U UN and other international organizations to deal with these emerging technologies and threats that we've been discussing? And what are the challenges and opportunities for multilateral action, such as arms treaties or peace negotiations? We simply need to rebuild architecture and the UN and the regional institutions, such as the EU, uh, ASEAN and others, are vital to a stable world. And that includes dealing with the adversarial implications of new technologies. Um, we need a new paradigm, if you like, of arms control, of, of threat control, of, of, of establishing rules and mechanisms and confidence building systems where we can understand that the, the civilian applications of those great technologies for the benefit of all is the aim and not the dark side. But in the book, you know, we look closely at the dark side and it's happening it's there um, and if it succeeds it will destroy architectures like the un and we'll end up in a world of rail politique and mac politique not dissimilar from that before world war one and to my mind that's not a place we should go back to because frankly um the implications of that are very very dark indeed so uh, i would call upon all the major powers to reinvest their political capital in the United Nations and other institutions because they are ultimately the best guarantee, not just of peace, but of prosperity and well-being of our peoples. And at the end of the day, that is the object of diplomacy for all of us in the 21st century, uh, in which we deal with inequality, in which we deal with poverty, but we have to have the institutions and the mechanisms that are, can, can devote their energies on those vital issues. Uh, and are not simply diverted dealing with one crisis after another crisis of power posturing of power plays between major militarized actors it's 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 crucial that we start moving in that direction because of a fear not if not i fear for the future if not for me at my age certainly for for you ethan and i wouldn't wish that upon you or any of your generation thank you julian and um i've only had a uh, the pleasure to read a, a bits and pieces of your book, but I would highly recommend it to everyone in the audience. Thank you, sir. Available. My first good review. Well done, Ethan. <laughs>
Wonderful. The check's in the post. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us today, especially so late in the day for you. I really appreciate it. We really enjoy your insights and, and with your final thoughts. I actually, it's it's a perfect moment to, to move on. Uh, the United Nations is uh, thank you again and, and have a good night. And you, my so, pleasure. The United Nations is the closest we have to global governance in spite of all the criticism that we hear about multilateralism and the imperfections of the UN system. States have interests and often those are conflicting interests. However, the UN provides opportunities to these countries with opposed interests to cooperate together in tackling mutual challenges. It provides a forum, a chat room, if you, if you will, to discuss mutual open issues and a framework for discussion aimed at a solution of global problems. The role of WHO and its COVAX facility, for instance, is immensely important in resolving the current pandemic and working towards global distribution of vaccine. Certainly, this is the time for action to bring about a more equitable global distribution of resources in general. We will discuss multilateralism and the UN system with our next speaker, Ms. Rosemary De Carlo, Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs of the United Nations. She has held this post since May 2018, having been appointed by Secretary General Antonio Guterres. As Under Secretary General, Ms. De Carlo advises the Secretary General on global peace and security issues while also overseeing good office initiatives and field-based political missions in Africa, Europe, the Middle East, Central and Southeast Asia, and the Americas. Prior to holding the post of USG for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, Ms. DiCarlo served as a Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, representing the United States at the UN Security Council and the General Assembly. She also held the position of Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs at the US Department of State and the Director for United Nations Affairs at the National Security Council. From 2015 to 2018, Ms. DiCarlo was president of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy and was appointed a senior fellow and lecturer at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. I have also known and worked with Rosemary um, in her and my different capacities for a number of years. Rosemary, welcome and thank you for your participation in today's seminar. We are so excited to learn more about your perspective. So hello and welcome again. Thank you so much, Kalinda, and it's so nice to see you again. Um, and I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, I'm excited about the work that I do, and I hope that I can share with all of you uh, my perspectives on, on the importance of the United Nations and the importance of multilateral approaches. Thank you, and I really appreciate that. And I'm uh, uh, absolutely certain that our students and everyone else who is watching will very much appreciate your views, insights, your experience. Uh, and your ideas uh, on the future of the UN and multilateralism. So Rosemary, what would you say is the biggest challenge facing multilateral institutions today? Okay, well, first, let me just say it's, it's, obvious, it's obvious that we've got a weakening consensus about multilateral approaches. We see difficulties in decision-making by UN legislative bodies, such as the Security Council, but also the General Assembly and other bodies. Um, there are disagreements over values, uh, competition for influence. I would say the biggest problem though that I see and the reason why the membership has not come to greater agreement is because there are different interpretations of the very principles that the United Nations is based on. Let's take for example, the issue of sovereignty. And I think this is what is the cause for many of the uh, for the inability really to come together on some issues. Let's take the case of Myanmar and we see what's happening in Myanmar today. We have quite a large outcry among the UN membership, but certainly it is not uh, across the board. Uh, so again, when I say difference of opinion on sovereignty, on what a, a sovereign can and can't do, 
who that sovereign is responsible to. We would say that the, the sovereign is responsible to the people in his own country, but also to the greater international community. Uh, so I think this is a this is a big problem that needs to be overcome in a discussion of what the United Nations stands for. What do these principles mean? What does it mean not to use force? Uh, how seriously are member states taking what are the, the real core of what the United Nations is based on? I think that's a would be a healthy discussion going forward. Uh, absolutely. And uh, what do you think is the greatest value of diplomacy today? And what opportunities can be achieved through diplomacy that could otherwise not be, and specifically in these cases that you've mentioned yourself? Okay. Well, I had a department that deals with conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and peace building. So we're dealing with conf conflicts or the potential for conflicts around the world. And I'll give you some examples that uh, we are dealing with today where we have missions, Libya, Somalia, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and I could go on. Uh, and I think I've seen when we take it seriously and when we have support from regional member states and the international community, we can help either avert a conflict from taking place or help to resolve it. But it takes that kind of cooperation. It's not just the UN that can do it, not just the UN envoy. It takes the support from important players in the international community, can make a, a real difference in the lives of people and save lives. And I'll give you just give you a couple of examples. I think we have done a, a tremendous job in Colombia. Uh, and it wasn't just the UN, it was the Colombians themselves with whom we worked, uh, member states who supported the Colombian peace process, and the country has come a very long way uh, in dealing with its insurgent groups. Very important. Uh, we also, we avoided a potential uh, conflict uh, in Bolivia. Now again, uh, there are still remain problems in Bolivia today, but we did avoid a conflict over a disputed election over a year ago. Uh, by using preventive diplomacy, working with the European Union uh, and the Catholic Bishops Conference uh, in trying to get the parties together on a way forward after a disputed election. Uh, we certainly, I think, have done, uh, uh, made a difference, I would say, in Libya today. We could not have done this if we did not have the support of a large segment of the international community working with the United Nations, countries with influence on the parties in conflict to help move the process along. We have a ceasefire today. It needs implementation. A lot more needs to be done, but we've come a long way over the last year. Yes, and I can I can testify to that. I mean, I, I myself lived through a war and I, I've seen the peacekeeping and then later on the peace building process. And I saw how much it takes to invest into reconciliation, whether it's post-conflict or even pre-conflict mm -hmm. uh, uh, reconciliation in, in uh, order to avoid conflict. And uh, I think what's also very important is um, uh, mass atrocities against civilian populations uh, in uh, either conflict areas or where there is a looming conflict. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit on why you, why you think, you know, multilateralism is under so much attack today, but why do you think it, it is essential to have strong multilateral organizations in the current international climate? And what are the benefits and values of having strong multilateral institutions and relationships? Well, I, I would say that multilateralism is needed more today than ever. Um, and I think it's most unfortunate um, that we see um, cracks in the multilateral system. But let's just take a look at some of the crises that we're dealing with, the pandemic, first and foremost. Uh, it is not going to be resolved unless countries work together. It's not going to be resolved unless shared uh, scientific research, uh, shared vaccines, uh, many, many, many things that are going to be needed first just to stamp out the disease, but then in terms of building back after the pandemic. Uh, we've seen how it has affected the socioeconomic climate in many countries. Uh, we've seen what it has done, for example, to women in many parts of the world, the increase in violence against women, the fact that women are the ones who have lost 
many of the jobs, given the positions that they've held in a society. Uh, so we've lost, we've lost ground and we need to build back uh, from that going forward. Um, the issue of climate, uh, there is no, no doubt that we need to work together to deal with the effects of climate change, uh, certainly to mitigate its effects, but also to deal with the security aspects of climate change, as we've seen where changes in climate have exacerbated, for example, movements of people in various parts of the world. It's not something that can be done by just a few countries alone. It, it really will take you know, a good segment of the international community to come together on it. New technologies, very good on the one hand in that they've enabled us to do things like have a meeting remotely uh, and have improved our lives significantly, uh, but they've also uh, created certain concerns, whether it be social media where we see hate speech or for example, um, cyber, cyber attacks and what that can do. It's another kind of warfare. Uh, so there, there's a lot that needs to be discussed internationally going forward to really improve the societies that we live in and to have a safer and more productive world. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, uh, with all of these uh, issues, but especially when you mentioned the pandemic, the, the COVID-19 crisis, uh, unfortunately, we have seen uh, the rise in the so-called COVID nationalism as societies turn in and try to protect themselves and, and protect their economies and the healthcare systems. But the truth of the matter is, un unless we have an equitable global distribution of the vaccine, and in that sense, transfer of knowledge uh, and uh, experience and the production of vaccine, we're not going to be able to protect ourselves. We'll see new variants of, of COVID uh, popping up that will not protect us, not protect those who have been vaccinated already. And in addition, it will influence global relations in terms that it not only affects your own economy, how hard it has been hit by the domestic situation, but also the situation of your trade investment and other partners. And unfortunately, uh, the situation in, uh, uh, in the developing uh, world and, and low and middle income countries with that respect is uh, really dire. And uh, apart from multilateral cooperation, I, I don't see any other solutions. But in that context and in the context of multilateral cooperation, how do you see the evolution of regional organizations competing or complementing global organizations like the UN? Well, first of all, I think that uh, regional organizations are very important. We've always had the, the view in the United Nations that if an issue can be resolved regionally, then of course that should be, you know, should go, go forward first. Uh, we work very closely with regional organizations around the world. Um, I should also note that as conflicts become more complex, they are often more regionally focused as well. So the region itself is involved. So the regional organization will make a tremendous difference. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, we work extremely closely with the African Union, uh, both on issues dealing with peace and security, but also on development issues. Uh, and um, we have worked you know, side by side with them in Somalia, in Libya, Central African Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, I could go on uh, with the countries where we're working together, whether it be paying joint, making joint visits, um, whether it can be in the case uh, such as, as Somalia, we are supporting Amazon, the African Union force that is there, uh, dealing with um, Al-Shabaab. Uh, but it really, it, it helps because we bring different perspectives uh, to a particular conflict or a particular issue can, but can play reinforcing roles and extremely important. Certainly in the case of Africa, as I've mentioned, the relationship is very close. Um, also working with the OSCE. We worked with the OSCE on Nagorno-Karabakh. We are very supportive of the Minsk co-chairs. Um, Ukraine, uh, a range of issues uh, on the European continent where we are in frequent contact with OSCE. League of Arab States, similarly. Uh, certainly in the case of Libya, but elsewhere also in um, the Arab region. Uh, and of course, the European Union is a good partner of ours. Now, the European Union functions very often as a very generous donor 
but they also bring a lot of political weight to a whole range of conflicts, conflicts around the world. Uh, I do think uh, it is extremely important uh, to continue those relationships. We're now also working with sub-regional organizations. Uh, we've got a number of uh, agreements with uh, organizations that cover a particular region, for example, on a, in a continent, uh, on Africa in particular. Uh, but we have found that it's led to a lot of progress. We learn a lot by working with those who are from the region. Absolutely. And I must say, you know, from my own experience as well, both going through, again, the peace building process and from working in the government, uh, the cooperation of, of regional institutions has been very valuable, not just with the UN, but with the OSC or the European Union, the prospect of the membership for Croatia was, I think, crucial in uh, giving impetus and in, in, in being a catalyst for the necessary reforms for democratization, etc. the so-called European organization process. But working together with the OSC, we were able really to close all the open issues that remained in Croatia in terms of the reconciliation process to carry the process forward and to focus on the joint future rather than the past that divided us. So I completely agree with you that the work of the UN and uh, regional organizations is absolutely complementary. Now, there's been a lot of talk lately about the reform of the UN, uh, more regional representation, mm -hmm. reform of the UN security Council, even the veto issue, etc. So, Rosemary, how would you strengthen or reform the UN or other institutions to face global challenges that we have been talking about? What would your ideal future outlook be for multilateralism? Okay. Well, I see it from a somewhat different pers perspective than from a member state uh, being inside the UN Secretariat, but I think it's extremely important that the UN focus more on conflict prevention rather than conflict resolution. Now, we spend a lot of money internationally uh, on conflict resolution, whether it be a peace process, a peacekeeping operation, uh, setting up a mission after a conflict has taken place. We need to focus a lot of our efforts now on preventing that conflict from happening. And conflict prevention is not just about mediation. It's not just about sending a mediator to pull parties back from the brink. It also is about development. It's about many other issues that can help and exacerbate tensions within a country. I always find it um, a bit discouraging uh, that uh, member states will pay for conflict resolution, but have not put enough funding into conflict prevention. Uh, and World, the World Bank has done studies that shows that an ounce of prevention can save millions of dollars going forward, um, rather than paying for uh, support to a country that has erupted into conflict. Uh, that would be my first and foremost reform that I'd like to see happen within the United Nations in particular, and other organizations as well. A real eye on conflict prevention and looking at all the ways that we need to, to deal um, with some of the challenges that are facing. Climate change, for example. I mentioned the, the impact of climate change on security. We need to be able to be dealing with local communities, intercommunal dialogue, you know, helping communities that are at odds with each other because of the movement of people, because of, the, of what climate change has done to their livelihoods uh, it, as a way of preventing conflicts from erupting down the road. I also think that um, we need to look greater, I think, at the areas where um, there are commonalities among member states. Arms control was raised by the previous speaker uh, and very important. If you think about what happened back in, in, during the Cold War, despite all of the animosity uh, among countries, you saw the two major nuclear powers coming together to negotiate arms control agreements that it by and large have lasted, that really helped save us from the brink. Uh, it's extremely important, I think, now to identify those areas where we can make that kind of difference uh, and where we can see that solving one issue perhaps might give the confidence or the trust to be able to go on and solve other issues that are in disagreement. And then finally, I would say that, again, we, we really do need to 
focus on sustainable development. And uh, we've got big challenges going forward uh, to implement the sustainable development goals that were agreed to several years ago, uh, but it will make a huge difference, I think, not only for prosperity, but also in terms of a more, more peaceful societies going forward. Oh, absolutely. When I when I spoke at the United Nations as president, I said that we really need to report on what we have done in order to implement the SDGs rather than use the podium as a self-serving um, podium to, to, to promote either ourselves as, uh, as politicians or just to, to keep repeating the same old conclusions. But now an, an issue that I think is of um, a crucial importance and that is so often sidelined. And in my first seminar, I talked about uh, the fact that uh, statistics show that when women are uh, involved in the peace process, the peace process is much more of a chance to succeed than when they're not. We've seen that in Croatia. We've seen that in some other parts of the world. So how can we ensure that gender perspective is at the center of the response? Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. First, I think we need to lead by example. Uh, and we've tried very hard to whenever we have a, a mediation team or leading a peace process to make sure that we have also women as mediators uh, at the table. Uh, we have set targets uh, for women's participation. Uh, not easy uh, to fulfill, and I will be very frank with you. We were, we were very pleased we were able to get 30% uh, female participation in the Constitutional Committee uh, dealing uh, with Syria. Uh, in the most recent political dialogue on Libya, we had 22% women at the table. Not easy to do, and they don't just come. Uh, so it, it involves a lot of work leading up to that process, including uh, training, confidence building, um, cajoling, frankly, uh, those who were in power to include women in their delegations. Uh, we have uh, worked very hard with, again, the African Union, on training uh, women mediators in Africa to deal not only with sort of national dialogues, but also with local community initiatives. Um, we've spent a lot of effort in the last couple of years uh, working with Afghan women to prepare them for the current negotiations. Now, I will be very frank, we're quite disappointed that the number of women uh, in Doha and negotiating the future of Afghanistan is very few. Uh, we would have anticipated more uh, and uh, we are working now to try to find ways uh, to get more women involved in the Afghan peace process. One thing that we have uh, decided is that when we are in the lead on a peace process, uh, we will insist on women at the table. Again, we may not get the 30% target that we would like, uh, but we certainly expect to have women at the table for us to be leading it. Uh, and one way of, of doing this is by having if you will, bonus seats at the table. Let's say you have two delegations, 10 and 10. Well, one might get 13 if they're willing to add three women to their delegation. Uh, I think they're just little tricks that we're playing here, but uh, other than that, it makes it very difficult. We've seen, it doesn't matter whether it's Libya, with Afghanistan, I, Somalia, there are competent women who are prepared and ready to lead. They just need to be given the opportunity. Oh, I absolutely commend you and I wish you all the best in that effort. I firmly believe that women should not be looked at just victims, but as agents of change in any peace uh, keeping or peace building uh, process. Uh, now I'm going to turn to Kaylee, one of my other student associates and uh, a co-producer to uh, this uh, of this seminar to ask you the final couple of questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Carlo, and thank you for joining us. So my first question for you would be, how does the UN work to advance peace? How do we work to advance peace? Well, I think, I mean, throughout the organization, it's about peace whether it's about development, uh, human rights, uh, or uh, humanitarian assistance, or as I said, uh, um, dealing with conflict uh, resolution. Uh, the goal is to promote one, tolerance, respect for others, uh, and respect for certain principles upon which to guide international relations. That is the UN Charter. It's 
that are embodied in the UN Charter and various other UN documents, Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it is, um, it is the, the, the issue that really is through all of the work that every aspect of the United Nations does. Uh, and peace is, is really something that cannot be achieved by just working one track alone. One of the reasons why Secretary General Guterres, when he uh, took office in 2017, launched, launched a reform of the UN system, uh, where there would be greater synergies among the various pillars of the United Nations, so that political work wasn't just, you know, we didn't keep, we didn't just think about things that were political, but make sure we were mingled with our de development colleagues to understand the impact of one issue upon the other. Um, this is basically at the heart of what we do. Thank you for that. Um, and so some of us know that in March of 2020, Secretary General Gutierrez called for a global ceasefire in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, could you perhaps tell us a bit more about it and do you think it is succeeding? Thank you very much for that question. Yes, Se Secretary General uh, announced uh, uh, an appeal for a global ceasefire at that time in order to um, create the space for the delivery of humanitarian assistance uh, during, as the pandemic started, uh, and also to create opportunities uh, for dialogue and, for help, and perhaps resolution of conflicts. Uh, initially, it received tremendous support. We had, I can't remember the number of countries, 150 countries, members of the UN that signed on to it, a number of armed groups uh, that did so, uh, religious leaders. Uh, in practice, it did not have the tangible results we would have liked. Uh, we, we understood we were going to have to keep at, at it and work harder in order to get ceasefires on the ground. Now, in some cases, we were able to do so. Libya, a quick, you know, case in point, uh, we saw that things had simmered down in, in Syria, for example. Uh, but then we saw a conflict erupt in other places like Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, we still continue to call for ceasefires. Uh, we are close in some places. I think we're, we've made progress, for example, in Yemen. Uh, we've seen in Sudan, for example, some uh, uh, warring parties put down their arms and join the peace process that was also established over a year ago. Uh, and uh, we will continue to work at, at um, getting countries to put down their, gun, their guns, to silence the guns, in order not just to deal with the pandemic now, but to see what they can do to deal with the impact of the pandemic in their countries. I mentioned the socioeconomic impact earlier. Well, Thank you for that, and it was a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you. Well, Rosemary, thank you so much for this very interesting and productive discussion and for your insights. Uh, it's been uh, very valuable. I'm just sorry we don't have more time uh, to go on, but we're nearing uh, the close of our hour for this seminar. So thank you again for your participation and all the best to you and hope to see you soon. Thank you as well. All the best to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. So as we have seen, international relations are becoming increasingly relevant as the globalized world grows more and more in interconnected through communications, travel, trade, investment, commerce, migration, the modern media and social networks, as well as the common concerns about the pressing transborder and asymmetric threats and challenges, some of which we have discussed today. Diplomacy itself is facing multiple challenges, including those that at first sound like opportunities, to which I can testify myself from my own experience, such as, for instance, close contacts between leaders, which can lead to bypassing the diplomatic service, which in turn poses the danger of misinformation or miscoordination. Countries often benefit from close relations between leaders who can contact each other in moments of crisis. However, this, this can also create full, false impressions of closeness between countries, whereas the reality of relationship is different. Thankfully, we have multilateral organizations and institutions such as the UN and others 
where countries can discuss the common problems, the common challenges that we're facing, but also discuss their bilateral issues on the sidelines. And that is another value of multilateralism. Technological advances, the modern media and social networks will continue to dictate the tempo. Internet governance will set important precedents for the way that we regulate communications. And let us just remember the Twitter experience with former President Trump, which raised uh, a discussion that I believe will, will continue when it comes to regulating uh, the social networks and the new media. After all that has been said, some of you might be asking yourselves the question, is there a future for diplomacy? And my answer is, Yes, there is definitely diplomacy remains indispensable. Traditional diplomacy and closed door policy is still needed. I do not see another way to negotiate agreements such as the JCPOA, for instance, and confidentiality still remains a fundamental aspect of negotiations, although I did talk about uh, the need for governments to be as transparent as possible. And Julian uh, pointed to precisely this aspect of the confidentiality that is still needed in some of the processes. Wars obviously cannot be ended over social media and economic disputes cannot be resolved without direct negotiations. The same goes for the control of nuclear, uh, nuclear armament and many other issues. Direct dialogue between governments is important to deal with challenges that we are all facing. However, you know, one might pose a question, could diplomacy alone have dealt with a problem such as ISIS and its expansion? And in which way could it have helped more in resolving the crisis quicker? Obviously, the role of a traditional diplomat or diplomatic service has changed and diplomacy has to adapt to deal with challenges and embrace opportunities to make strategic use of both new media and traditional diplomatic processes to manage the increasingly complex risks and relations between states and non-state actors of the 21st century. There is pressing need for diplomacy to radically alter some of its approaches and to become more adaptive, more innovative, more interdisciplinary, uh, more open and to work and respond much faster. This goes both for bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. And I think, I, you know, I welcome um, the, the return of the US to multilateral institutions. Personally, I think it's indispensable. And I cannot uh, underline enough the value of multilateralism to proceed further in facing together the global challenges. And finally, I would once again like to thank our distinguished guests today who have contributed to this discussion, as well as my co-producers, Kaylee and Ethan, for their help. And I also would like to thank Louis, uh, another one of my student associates, for providing the background uh, from Croatia for the seminar, although I am currently at the Sign Institute in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you all for joining in today and let me invite you all to tune in next week for our next seminar on NATO and the future of the Transatlantic Alliance on Monday the 5th of April at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 24 hours GMT. Thank you.